I am now so pleased to be joined by Dr. Scott Hahn. Many of you probably know him, a founder and president of the St. Paul Center and the author of, at last count, I think, 7,000 books, the newest one of which is Catholics in Exile, Biblical Wisdom for the Journey Home, and founder of Emmaus Academy and many, many other wonderful works. Scott, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's great to be with you, Michael. It's also been fun to listen to you for the last five minutes or so. Your assistant uh, kind of let me in on all of this when you were discussing the principle of non-contradiction and Mayflower cigars. And so I realized Mayflower cigars cannot be and not be at the same time <laughs> That's and the you, same relation. You make a great point. See, this is the kind of logic <laughs> that we have to bring on a leading theologian for. So, Scott, when I started Theology Thursday as part of this member block, you were the guy I had in mind. And so I was very much hoping to see you when you were in Nashville last week or the week before. I was very excited to go to the St. Paul Center Gala, and it, it was an amazing event from everything I heard. And then these jerks at the Daily Wire shipped me overseas to the motherland and made me miss out on it. So now at least we get you uh, here. C could you just, before we begin, for those who are not well acquainted with you, Talk a little bit about how you became uh, one of the leading Catholic theologians. Well, I started off as a Presbyterian pastor back in the early 80s. Uh, I had gone to seminary, and I began to study the early church fathers. And when I began to recognize the depth of the connection between the Old and the New Testament, it led me to the Eucharist and to the doctrine of the real presence and the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And in the Presbyterian world, that's just a disconnect. And so I went in search of a church, hoping I wouldn't have to become Catholic. But at the Easter Vigil in 1986, uh, I was dragged kicking and screaming joyfully into my newfound home. And ended up writing a book with my bride, Kimberly, back, oh, 30 years ago, called Rome Sweet Home, Our Journey to Catholicism. We just celebrated the anniversary of that book shortly after we celebrated our 44th wedding anniversary, but uh, that tells the rest of the story. So, first of all, Scott, that book title is up there with uh, my friend Ryan Anderson has a book called When Harry Became Sally, which is about transgenderism. <laughs> and those are both some of the great titles I've ever heard uh, with books. And, you know, you've got many others that I've recommended to a lot of people, including Rome, Sweet Home. But I had a, a Catholic friend of mine who was looking around at some of the difficulties in the church these days and some of the unfortunate things coming out of uh, prelates. And uh, a Catholic, I, I mentioned to this Catholic friend, I said, oh, an, another friend of ours is converting. And uh, he said, even now? Why would anybody convert now? This seems like the worst possible time to convert. So what do you say to people who, who look around the state of uh, the church on earth and say, mm, things aren't looking so great? Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is that Rome Sweet Home might be a nice title, but it's not precise because the fact is when we discover the Catholic faith, when we discover the Catholic Church, Catholic doesn't mean global, it doesn't mean Roman, it means universal. And so what you discover in becoming a Catholic is that the essence of the Catholic Church is much more in heaven than on earth. Hmm. where Christ is, where the Blessed Virgin, where the angels and the saints are. They don't form a bigger and older denomination. They are the Catholic Church in glory. We are the Catholics in a state of grace. And so we recognize that we distinguish to unite these two, but this is why my most recent book really captures it, I think, with greater precision, and that is we are Catholics in exile. And so when we recognize what Paul tells the Philippians in Philippians 3.20 that our polytuma, our citizenship, our commonwealth, and he uses the technical political term, is in heaven. It doesn't mean that we check out here. No, it means that we have dual citizenship, but they're not equal. One is far greater than the other. And so Rome's sweet home is sort of a good starting point, but Catholics in exile, I think, is a much more accurate and constructive way of approaching how we are as Catholics living in America or anywhere else in the West. So what do you make? You, you've had a, a rather long career. You, as you mentioned, it's been a while since you wrote your first book. It seems to me people are much more interested in religion, and not just as a matter of comparative study, but as a question of truth and falsehood, than they have been at any time in my lifetime. Uh, you know, when I was a kid and I fell away from the faith, it was the age of the new atheists and mocking religion and God is not great and all that, 
all that nonsense. And now that really seems to have fallen out of favor. And people seem, uh, well, we see holy wars erupting around the world. And, but, but even at the domestic front, we see a much more serious grappling with religion, up to and including the new Speaker of the House of Representatives. What right. impelled that? Uh, and where does that lead? I'm sure there are many factors that experts can identify that all converge upon this simple observation. But for us as Catholics, and for me as a theologian, I can't help but wonder if people recognize that religion is at the basis of practically all civilizations. And because our civilization is in a state of decline, I mean, in a real self-destruct mode, I think people are beginning to recognize that, look, if we're trying to identify the source of law and authority and everything else, what we're really doing is dabbling in the divinities because the source of law, power, authority cannot be reduced to the White House or to Wall Street. Hmm. And so people are beginning to wake up and realize, you know what? Religion is unique. It identifies the absolute. But I would say even more that the Catholic faith has this unique capacity to form civilizations that are durable and just. And as Tom Holland points out in his book, Dominion, as an agnostic, Nothing causes human rights and, and values to flourish like the Catholic faith, like the Catholic Church. So on the one hand, the Catholic Church has this unique capacity to form civilizations more than any other religion. On the other hand, the purpose of the Catholic faith is not to form civilizations, but to form saints, to make us holy, mm. which I think mm. also explains why the Catholic faith has a unique capacity to form persecution hostility, mm. opposition, because the demands of divine love on our lives, I mean, he loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. He wants to make us saints and not just good citizens. And when mm. people wake up and realize, wait a minute, that's way too demanding. Chastity, fidelity, purity, indissolubility deals off. Then I think the capacity to form a civilization of love is practically matched by a capacity to generate hostility from people who know what they want, and that's not holiness. That's a, a great point, because Ayan Hirsi Ali, this famous atheist who had left Islam and became a very prominent, uh, seemingly pro-civilization, but atheist political figure— just a few days ago, she wrote a column. She said, I'm now a Christian. And she said, I'm a Christian because Christianity makes civilizations. And uh, civilization will not be able to support itself on agnosticism or secularism or liberalism or whatever. Uh, and some people criticized her. And I thought, well, look, that's a good way in. I, I'm, I think ob observing politics, observing the, the real world expressed in flesh and blood in time and space, I think that's fine. We have an incarnational faith. So, of course, you know, that, that's okay. But it's not the end. And so when you say, you no, know, the, the purpose of the church is not to make civilizations. Ultimately, it's to make saints. People write in a lot struggling with all sorts of issues. The, 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 probably the primary issue that people struggle with when they write into the mailbag, especially young men, is porn. They say porn is everywhere and I can't break this habit. And so I know I'm called to purity, but I can't, I, I can't stop this issue. And there, there are many others as well. People who are using drugs, people who are, people who are just wasting all their time scrolling on social media, people who are falling into all sorts of sin. What would you tell them? How would you advise them on that point when they say, look, I want to be holy, I recognize the point of religion is to make me into a saint, but I just, it's just too demanding, I just can't do it. Yeah, I mean, I would say what G.K. Chesterton said, and that is becoming a saint isn't hard, it's just humanly impossible. Apart from the divine, apart from the supernatural, apart from the sacraments, they don't make it easy to become holy, but it makes it possible. You know, and I think back to the early 80s when I began struggling with my own intellectual search, but I also was struggling with my own personal issues, you know, weakness. I had been married four or five years, but quite naively, I just assumed that once you married a beautiful gal, you didn't notice gals, you know, but I mean, the legacy of Playboy for me since like junior high and senior high was with me and I would pray and I would work, you know, and hmm. struggle as a pastor, as a husband, as a father. And then it was the last day of 1983. I remember this because of Orwell's 84, where somebody, I don't know who gave me a rosary. 
I picked it up. I was still at least two or three years away from becoming a Catholic, but 99 out of 100 of my own research projects had led me to the Catholic Church. And I'm thinking, Mary, Mary, she seems quite contrary to everything I know from the Bible, <laughs> but what if they're right? And so I, I apologize to God in advance. If this offends you, I'm sorry, but I can't help but wonder if you don't want to use a woman who is a virgin, who is the queen of heaven in my life. And I prayed a rosary that last day in 1983. And for the next several months, I forgot that I prayed it. And for the next several months, I found a freedom that I had never known since before my adolescence. I found the rosary cleaning out my desk drawer. I said, oops, I'm sorry. What a forgetful ingrate. And I've been praying it every single day since then. Two sets of mysteries today just to prepare for our conversation. But I got to tell you, the Blessed Virgin, the Holy Rosary, the sacraments, especially confession, getting spiritual direction. I mean, when I discovered all of this about the Catholic faith, it was like heaven and all of this other stuff added as well. And this might sound like religious hype, but the fact is, I'm almost now 40 years a Catholic, and I realize it's much truer and more beautiful than I thought it was when I entered the church. It's a lot harder to become holier than I realized when I entered the church. Hmm. So this is hard-headed hmm. realism now. You know, the sacraments, the saints, the Blessed Virgin, these things are what make it possible. But never does it start becoming easy. Oh, we're just coasting downhill from this point on. That's a, a beautiful point, too, because a similar thing happened with me. When I reverted to the faith uh, through, uh, you know, mm. one guy was uh, Alvin Plantinga, who's a Calvinist philosopher oh, yeah. at Notre Dame Catholic University. And so it's not as though I just jumped right into the deep wells of uh, Catholicism. But for me, the biggest impediments were the rosary, were Mary, were uh, I, at least I thought these were impediments. There were the sacraments, why we did all these rituals and things. And, and now I realize what great lifelines they are, what great, what great aids they are, what indispensable aids they are. But to your point as well, you know, the, the, the better I've gotten since that time, the, the, the more clearly I see the, the fallenness of the world and my own sins. So, so the, the, the way I fixed a few things, or a few things were fixed for me, I suppose, uh, and I cooperated with that. But then you think, oh, okay, well, I checked off those three boxes. Now I'm good, right? Oh, no, wait a second. There were all of these other awful things that I was doing and thinking and desiring that, that I didn't even realize that I was doing. Oh, my goodness, I, what, a, what a road have I to go, which will probably uh, continue for quite some time. You know, what we're discussing right now seems to play out in two different ways. On the one hand, in our own personal lives, privately, in our marriage and family, in our prayer as well. On the other hand, publicly, socially, politically. You know, the, in the last two or three years, I've written two books with Brandon McGinley. One came out about three years ago called It Is Right and Just, Why the Future of Civilization Depends on True Religion. The other one that just came out a few days ago is, as you mentioned, Catholics in Exile, Biblical Wisdom for the Journey Home. It's sort of like, well, which is it? Does the Catholic faith have the capacity to form civilization? Yes. It's going to generate hostility. Am I going to live to see it? Are my kids, are my grandkids? I've got six kids now and 22 grandkids. But I'm realistic enough to realize that, look— Catholics don't even want Catholic civilization. Right. We've got to at least foster the desire for that as well as holiness. But in the meantime, Catholics in Exile is the book I think that people need. If you're striving to live a virtuous life, but you wake up one day and you realize, I live in fear of secular authorities because I'm trying to be virtuous. I even live in fear of corrupt authorities within the church because right. I'm striving to live a holy and a traditional life. Catholic life. And so Catholics in exile is for me something that has been rising in my mind and in my heart for several years. That's wonderful. And uh, before I let you go, over time as always, um, could you just mention something about Emmaus Academy for anyone who might be interested? Yeah. Almost a quarter of a century ago, we founded the uh, St. Paul Center, biblical literacy for lay people, biblical fluency for the clergy, but how to read the Bible from the heart of the church. So Emmaus Road is our paradigm. You know, 
were not our hearts burning within us as he opened the scriptures, but our eyes are opened in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread. So we have Emmaus Academy as a platform, not for bachelor degree, master's degree, but for people who are busy, but interested in growing in prayer in understanding the prophets and understanding the Psalms. I, I have a, a course on the gospel of uh, how to read the Bible, uh, also the gospel according to St. Paul. You know, and, and this is for busy people who want to enroll in these courses and take them at their own pace, but grow in understanding. We have a new one coming out next month on the liturgical vision of J.R.R. Tolkien by this brilliant professor, Dr. Ben Reinhardt. And I think it's going to really capture the imagination of many people. That's marvelous. And in the meantime, people need to go get the book Catholics in Exile, as well as Scott's other 15,000 books, all of which I highly recommend. Scott, thank you so much for coming on the show. What a delight. Thank you for inviting me, Michael.